important to us. And so we wanted to um, really make sure that both John Lewis and Waitrose as kind of well-known brands is really a place where uh, people would aspire to want to come and work with us um, and that we really feel that irrespective of people's backgrounds, what their experiences are, they really feel that they can thrive within our business. So some of those principles are really important to us. And last summer, as we announced a package of support for our working families uh, in the business, um, and we did it because partners were telling us it was really um, important to them. And we also had been reporting on our gender pay gap for the last three or four years. And we understood with other research that we knew this was an area that we needed to, we wanted to be sort of quite market leading. So I was going to touch upon a couple of areas, in particular, our new equal parenthood policy, um, and then also our approach to flexible working, because we feel both of them we think are making quite a step change um, compared to some of our competitors and um, within retail. Like I said at the start, it is still quite early days. So a lot of these changes we um, introduced uh, towards the back end of 2021, um, but we're starting to see some interesting findings, but we, we, we're gonna need to keep tracking that. And it could be something that in a year's time, I, I come back and just go and share how we're progressing, but we're, we're happy to share some of the early insights that we've seen already. So I guess just speaking to the experience in this virtual room, I know, um, you know, there's many studies that tell us that the sharing childcare is really good from a gender equality perspective and definitely helping uh, reduce the gender pay gap. Um, and yet being able to afford to take the time off is a real barrier in particular for low income families. And we see that and I'll touch upon some of the um, insights and research that we've done. To understand that. We heard really loud and clear from um, our partners. So we have a working parents network and we also have a gender network whereby um, they shared with us really loud and clear. So this was other partners telling this network um, around in particular, if you look at the two weeks paid paternity leave we offered just wasn't enough. Um, and actually uh, what we did offer uh, for many, it, was, uh, it wasn't affordable for them to take the time off. So they felt the time wasn't enough for them to really have time with their new family. And also it, it caused them a real um, affordability challenge to be able to um, access that support. So working with our, our networks, we developed our equal parenthood policy, which essentially means that all of our partners, regardless of how they've become a parent, so that includes adoption as well as also um, natural birth, will receive 26 weeks paid leave. So that's 14 weeks at full contractual pay and followed by 12 weeks at 50% of contractual pay once they've worked with us for a year. So they need to have been with us a year and then they would be um, entitled to be able to access that support. Um, we did have to think quite carefully just about how we designed um, the, this policy because of the diverse nature of our business. And we were acutely aware that we have both office jobs that are might, maybe a bit more easier to accommodate all the way through to operational roles. Um, whereby we needed to make sure the policy could fit across quite a diverse range um, of working environments. So we had to think about things such as backfilling partners um, when they took certain leave, how roles and responsibilities were divided up um, and how that could really work in some of our shops and, and warehouses. Um, so since we've introduced the new policy, we've seen quite a significant increase um, in the take up of what was paternity leave um, and we now call it co-parent leave so importantly we've also changed the terminology of it so actually for single sex parents um, you know the traditional maternity paternity leave we've purposely gone to call it equal parenthood leave um, and on average partners are taking 16 weeks leave uh, when they have a child um, and then only a quarter of uh, our partners so far are taking the additional 12 weeks leave at half pay. And I think that comes back to the point around affordability is a really important factor when people are taking parental leave because they've just got to be able to balance the books to be able to, you know, still still um, afford their home along with um, time with their children. We've also seen an increase in partners taking up shared parental leave too. Um, and we think that's because um, the equal parenthood policy has really raised um, awareness of their options. So whereas before, because it was either 
um, partners could take their maternity leave and it was such a short paternity leave. Now that there's a lot more um, equality there, it's actually genuinely driving a conversation about shared care and who would take because some of the affordability parts being taken off the table, actually, how would they want to go and share those responsibilities? And it's opened up a dialogue that I just don't think um, made that feasible before. So that's been, that's interesting to see. And I think very interesting to go and track going forward. Um, we really have had an overwhelming response from our co-parents taking the leave, uh, what it means to them. It's been incredibly positive. It was very positive when we launched it. Um, and we continue to get great feedback of just such a difference it makes. It's such an early part of bringing, um, you know, a child into you know the household, and um, actually just the options and their ability to be able to really play um, a key part um, has been really important. And there's a real sense that they can be in it together with their birth partner from the start, um, and and have that important bonding time, which we just know is really critical with their new baby. We've had also quite a bit of feedback from our co-parents that whose partners have had traumatic births or they've had long recoveries from, say, C-sections. And that's been because they've been able to take the extra time off to support them. And we'd heard before we brought in the policy, actually, that was some of the things some of our partners really struggled with, that actually there were difficult circumstances with, say, a birth and someone could only really take a week off and they had to go straight back to work because they couldn't afford to take any more time off. So it has definitely created quite a shift for the kind of not straightforward situations to give people again optionality to be able to provide more support. Mm. We've also um, heard that it's really helped them their partner is self-employed. So this is where they might be with a partner that works outside of John Lewis. Um, and they might be running their own business. Um, and we've heard that they've, in particular, um, on your policy has allowed some women that are self-employed to go and still maintain their responsibilities of running their business and keeping their business going and enabling their partner, a co-partner to go and take on some of the uh, burden and some of the responsibilities um, of a child coming in uh, to their family. Um, which again, I think is quite an interesting dynamic when you go to look at, you know, how do we go and help women, you know, continue with, either running their business or running their careers because they've got more options. So we know we're learning lots. Like I say, these are, these are quite initial observations. We're only sort of three, four months into it. And we are gonna to continue to monitor the impact of the policy and in particular, the experience of our partners that are coming back from extended leave to see whether um, this flexible approach for all genders is really working in our business. So um, it'll be interesting to see how that how that plays out. But we're feeling confident just given the positive response that that will continue to um, have it in that way. So the second area I wanted to just touch upon was flexible working. So we again have done um, quite a lot of work around our flexible working that started earlier than 2021, I think it's fair to say the pandemic has really gone and accelerated some of our thinking, which I think other organisations have had the same, just by, by need and necessity. And we know that retail has been a destination of choice, in particular for women, because of the flexible working that's built into jobs um, in terms of how retail is structured. So often working hours, shift patterns can be agreed around caring responsibilities. And we know it's one of the few sectors along with education and health and social care, um, which also often often offers jobs that are close to home as well, which makes a, a, you know, a real impact to them be able to have, look after their caring responsibilities as well as um, their uh, jobs as well. Um, so like I say, our, our flexible working has existed within our business quite a while. Um, and we have done quite a bit to think about how do we really creatively make it work more. Um, and like I said, the last two years has really made us think quite carefully about how do we open it up. We have nearly half of our partners that work part time. So that's about just over sort of 45,000 partners uh, that work part time. Um, and we have been looking at how do part time workers progress more in their career. Um, sort of address some of the cultural barriers that we have and perceptions of part-time working. So there has been historical view that if you work reduced hours, it means your contributions not as much, and therefore you're not the type of person that would then want your roles because you're working part-time because of other responsibilities. So we've really been trying to uh, challenge some of those attitudes and views to recognise that you know part-time 
working um, really adds significant value and contribution to our business. Um, we did, uh, we partnered with the Behavioural Insights team a couple of years back and the Government Equalities Office to trial a flexible working uh, wording on our job adverts. So we tried to be a lot more proactive with showing that, you know, we embrace flexible working um, and this definitely saw an increase in applications. So we saw an increase by about 50% of the vacancies that we're advertising internally. And we also saw a um, increase in the proportion of applications from women as well for those roles. So we saw an uplift of about 13%. So it was incredibly positive with us being more proactive with us recognizing there are different ways to work in than the more kind of traditional um, full-time. Um, we, so, so we now have a flexible first policy. So in all vacancies that we advertise across the whole of the partnership, doesn't matter where you are, we are very explicit upfront that we would consider flexible working options. We do have a few operational reasons um, that we might restrict it, but to be honest, that's in the minority. We have really pushed all of our leaders uh, to go and start with the open point of, you could be able to work flexibly let's go and have the conversation rather than um, the other way around and so far we have definitely seen um, that step change so i guess we we know there is more we can be doing um, i don't think we sit as being uh, the best in it all but we definitely feel pretty proud in terms of um, some of the inroads we have made um, and we really want the partnership to be a kind of go-to place from an employer perspective that uh, people come and think that they can really go and uh, you know, be themselves, be able to have you know, caring responsibilities whilst also holding uh, key responsibilities and roles and be able to progress their careers uh, within the partnership. Um, so look, we feel pretty excited about it. And I'll, I'll pause, I think at this point, 